We have an amazing community in this church. We come from all over, all ages, all stages. But we have this little community within our church who don't attend here in person. They attend online, either for age, health, distance, any number of reasons. Or they just haven't found us physically yet, but they attend online. Ron Robbins is one of those people who attends online every Sunday. He's a member. He was a regular attender for decades. He still is a regular attender. Every Sunday he catches us online. And you know how I've had people reading the scripture lately as I get ready to preach? I asked Ron if he would read the scripture for us today. And he said, Ken, I can't get there. And I said, we'll get you there. So listen, as Ron reads the scripture for us this morning. It's Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Grateful and joy, made alive in Christ. Well, I've been a member of this church for 58 years. I'd like to be there in person, but I get the opportunity to read Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. And you were dead in your offenses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the course of this word, world, according to the prince of power of the air of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all previously lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath, just as the rest. But God being rich in mercy, because of his great love, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our wrongdoings, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the bounty less riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we should walk in him and walk in them. Amen. Amen. It has been great to be able to have God talk to us through these scripture readings. Now, maybe if you let me, we'll talk with God. Father, we praise you we worship you for who you are, what you've done, what you can do so bountifully. Help us, Father, to seek your purpose and the purpose in our life may be tied to you and that we may be closer to you each and every step of the way. And our purpose is one for you and we will find grateful and joy 
because of the Holy Spirit and what he means to us. And we thank you, Father, for Jesus, who gives us this chance to be saved and find us eternity forever. We thank you, Father. Now, as we come to you again, we pray that you will guide and direct our lives. Show us the purpose. Get us in that purpose that you'd want us to be, that you created us for. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Ron, if you can hear, they just clapped for God's word. Thank you guys for being a part of this church because you allow us to do so many things all because we want to celebrate all the things that God has done for us. One of the things that God has done for me because y'all always want to know about my personal life, I'm sure, is he gave me a wife. I did not ask her permission to talk about her today. I often do not ask her permission to talk about her. I just do it anyway. I'll hear about it later. But let me tell you something. She's good to me. A lot of different ways. But here's one in particular. She finds stuff for me. I hear her laughing now. It's right where she said it would be. It's right where I was looking and I can't find it. I think sometimes maybe she intentionally puts it behind something so I can't find it. And that way I'm reminded how much I need her. But sometimes, and you know how this goes, you probably have some, you know, had that experience where you're looking for something and you know where it should be. You picture it in your mind, the color of the packaging or the size or the shape. You know what it looks like. You know where it's supposed to be. You just can't find it. Or maybe you look for it and you don't see it because, wait, it looks different from where I thought. It's not exactly like I thought it looked like. I thought I remembered it being in a blue box. It's in a red box. I thought it was on the back of this shelf, but it's over there in that drawer. We know we're looking for something. We don't always find it. it this, is hap- this is not just a new development. This has happened all my married life and even before that. The scary thing is I had a dream early in the week this past week. This is not the Martin Luther King, I have a dream speech. This is just Ken telling you I have weird dreams sometimes. But it's one of those dreams where I couldn't find stuff that I knew was there or the stuff that I could find was not what I needed it to be. It was things like, I was with a large group. We were out like in this big field or something. Some event was going on. I was looking for food, couldn't find the right kind of food. I was looking for clothing and certain outfits and couldn't find the clothing that I needed. I was looking for all of this stuff. I was looking for shelter. We were supposed to be in something. And I couldn't find the way to the shelter. And I remember very specifically, there was worship going on on this hillside. And it wasn't exactly what I was looking for. All of this to say, the thing that bothered me most about that dream was the worship aspect. Because at this stage of my life, I like to worship. Harry, it's just one of my favorite things is to worship with you together or by myself, just God and me. I like to worship. I like to tell God, thank you. I like to tell God who he is to me. I like to worship. What brings me to worship 
is an understanding of the object of my worship. It's not only that, it's also the why of my worship, but it's as well just the gift of his salvation to me. I love it that they're doing John 3.16 back in the children's area this morning because it's thankful month. Well, for us, it's grateful month. That's what we're going to be talking about over the next Sundays of November, being grateful. Today, we're grateful for his grace. And this idea of finding worship, but maybe it's just not quite what we think it ought to be, might be because we're misunderstanding what worship ought to be. Worship is not just the thing you come to on Sunday morning. Worship is between you and your God. And so this is what we're going to look at in this scripture that Ron read. And it seems a little far-fetched to begin a passage on worshiping God and His grace and all that with such a negative outlook of who we are. But that's the past reality. That's where we're going to begin is with this past reality. So in Ephesians chapter 2, Ron just read it, but the first three verses, let me read again. You were dead in your trespasses and sin, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. We were all together in our disobedience and in our sin, and we were following the prince of disobedience, the the prince of the air, Satan. He was leading us all. At some point in our life, he was our leader. And this all began, it's not just a dream, it's a reality. It all began in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve made the bad choice, and that bad choice has had an eternal impact on us. Let me me rephrase that, not an eternal impact on all of us. It's made a temporal impact on everyone. But sometimes the eternity changes. That's what we're talking about today. That's the grace of God. But it was a permanent impact on God's creation, His good creation. And God is good, and we're not anymore. That's the present or the past reality. It's, if you define reality, the definition is the state of things as they are rather than as they are imagined to be. Sometimes we deny reality in our lives. We imagine how it ought to be, and that's what we think is the reality going on around us, but it's not really that. Reality is reality. It just is how, you know, my, my kids used to say, it is what it is. That's reality, and that's our, all our past that we share in common, every one of us. But the present reality is different. Ephesians 4 through 7, chapter 2, 4 through 7. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing richness of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. But God, this is a literary thematic transition. This is a device used by biblical writers, not just the writer here, but others besides Paul, but God. And about the time when everything looks lost, You know, when you're reading along in the story of the Bible and and the story in the Scripture, and things are not looking good for the folks there. Things are just not in great shape. And it's it's just going down, 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 down. But God. And all of a sudden, whoa, 
there's a transition. In the whole temperament of the story, there's a transition in the content of the story. And that's what we have here in verse 4. But God. I have, you have, we all have areas in our life that all of a sudden seem to be spiraling out of our control. We're rolling along real good and then all of a sudden something starts going wrong and we don't know how to change it. We need a but God moment Amen. in our life and he is faithful to do just that. He is faithful to give us those but God times in our lives, just like he did in Scripture. Look, here's three examples. In Matthew 19, 26, where Jesus looked at them and replied, this is so good. This is impossible for mere humans, but for God, all things are possible. Make a mental note. Things are impossible for us, but not for God. 1 Corinthians 1.27 Because, let me just refer back that all things are possible. He was talking to him about it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. It seemed like it was an impossible thing. But God makes all things possible. 1 Corinthians 1.27 But God chose what the world thinks foolish to shame the wise. And God chose what the world think weak to shame the strong. God doesn't do things in the manner that we might think he should. But God changes the way things are. It's often followed in Scripture with the words, in order that. Galatians 15, verse 16. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me through his grace in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Paul's telling the story. God set me apart from the very beginning. But God intervened in my life from the very beginning, from my mother's womb, in order that I might preach the good news among the Gentiles. In order that there's a reason for God inserting transitional moments in our life in order that you and I and Paul who have been rescued by God have a purpose in Christ but God in order that so if God's gonna roll into your life with a transition things are going crazy things are going south things are just going nuts but God and you go oh yes praise God thank you very much there's a method, there's a reason, there's a purpose. In order that God's going to get involved, in order that you can be involved with Him. And that's what He always does. We were redeemed. I love this line. I've heard this over and over and over again. But we were redeemed not just from something, but to something. And that's such an enlightening statement for me. I wasn't just saved from sin, but I was saved to serve Him. To glory in Him alone. I was saved not just from this, but to. And whatever He decides, because He is God. So, even in the middle of our own sins, our own wrongdoing, He made us alive. And the reason for God's grace is His great love for us. He saved us a seat, it said. We might be seated with Christ. That's not like standing room only invitation. That's like, I got a spot for you right here. And I've got a spot for you, and I've got a spot for you, and I've got a spot for you, and I've got... He saved you a seat. That's pretty specific. With Christ. So in ages to come, we might always have that place of abundant life in Christ. How do we get there? Do you remember the story? 
It's back in Mark chapter 2, and Jesus is teaching the people, and everybody's crowding in, and they're trying to hear his teaching. And some guys get there, and they've got a friend on a pallet, and they know if we can just get this guy to Jesus, he'll take care of him. And I have to think that it was the guy on the pallets, it was his idea, not the friend's. But the friends were great because they went along with what this crazy idea was. If you'll just get me to Jesus, he'll take care of it. You'll see. And they were like, yeah, we'll, we'll get this done. They got there and they couldn't get in the room. It was too crowded. So they went on top of the house and dug a hole in the roof. Hello. You know, Jesus, they're teaching. And all of a sudden, a little dirt and stuff starts falling down through the roof. And everybody's like, what is going on? And all of a sudden, this hole opens up. And this guy comes down on his pallet. They just lower him right down, you know, and get the crane operator to put him right down in there. And the first thing that Jesus says to him is your sins are forgiven. What a sweet statement. Not what in the world is going on. No. He sees the man. He sees the faith of the man. And the first thing he says to him is your sins are forgiven. I joined a book club the other day because I am such a geek. I've never been in a book club in my life. I'm one of the slowest readers you could ever imagine. But this one's advertised that I don't even have to read the book. They'll read it to me if I just tune in. I'm in. I can deal with this if I can squeeze it into my schedule. So Tuesdays at 1 o'clock, I get online and I... But what attracted me was the book that they're reading is the Gospel of Mark, but from it's from the First Nations translation. This is the American Indian. And it's from their translation of the book of Mark. And that phrase, your sins are forgiven, in the First Nations translation is, you are released from your broken ways. Thank you. Thank you. Guy came down. He didn't ask. He didn't say anything. He didn't say, oh, hi, my name is Joe. Nothing. Jesus saw him. He saw his faith. He said, your sins are forgiven. You are released from your broken ways. That's amazing. Last couple of verses, 8 and 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we could walk in them. By grace are you saved. I looked up definitions. I just look up definitions all the time for words because I want to make sure that I can communicate what I'm talking about. Grace, there's all kinds, of, there's several definitions out there that you can find. But the one I like the most was simple elegance. I thought, oh, what a phrase. That just translated grace to me in my mind. Simple elegance. And I think God saved us with such a great action, but with such simple elegance. Simple elegance is like, when you see that ballet dancer dance and it's fluid, when you see that athlete at the Olympics compete on the pummel horse, round and round and all this stuff, just makes it look so easy. When you see the Bengals get together and play and win a game <laughs> today, I'm prophesying. <laughs> Simple elegance, they just make it look so natural and so easy. By grace, you have been saved through faith. And it's a gift of God. Gift meaning you didn't have to pay for it. Yay! Somebody did. But you didn't have to pay for it. It was given to you. Not by works, not by things that you did. You can't earn this. 
So hear me, hear me, hear me. You are not going to live good enough lives to get into heaven. You are not going to do enough good deeds to get into heaven. You're not going to love your spouse enough to get into heaven. So that no one can boast, look what I did, and everybody's got to say, look what he did. Simple elegance. Wow. And we are his workmanship. Workmanship is a big deal. I mean, when your stuff breaks down, you kind of question the workmanship, right? But when you see it repaired and restored, you think, oh, that's great workmanship. In the Bible, in Exodus, God is pretty particular with what he told Moses about the building of the tabernacle. Right down to, and here's the comparisons, the extensive and minute details from dimensions to building materials, from structural framework to the color scheme in the embroidery. God was just so ultimately involved in the details of the workmanship. And he even prepared people to do that workmanship, blessed them, gifted them to do specific things. And I was thinking about workmanship. And I remembered on one of our trips to Pigeon Forge. We were wandering around town like we always do. And we were down in one of the little areas there where there's a lot of eateries and shops and stuff. And the, the official name is the Circle Bar T Forge and Blade Works. I have so many students that would just live there if they could. These people make knives right there. Fire them up, beat on them, shape them, do everything. You can go in there and make a knife. They'll show you how. So I was looking into the process as an example of workmanship of making a knife. I got a knife in my pocket. It had to be made. You know? So I'm a real man and I carry knives. <laughs> but somebody had to make this. But the, the handmade ones are the most beautiful pieces. It starts with a piece of metal. And not just any old metal do, but you'd be surprised at the kind of metals they can use. It might look rusty, no telling what kind of shape it's in, but that's where it starts. Well, when God gets ready to make something out of you, you might look a little rusty, you might be in the wrong shape, you might not even sure you're the right kind of material, but when God chooses you, He knows your strengths, your flaws, your abilities, your inabilities, and still He chooses you. So the key trait here, brothers and sisters in the Lord, is to make yourself available to Him, to His choosing. That's where it begins. It's almost as if that piece of metal gives itself up to the craftsman. The next thing that happens is the craftsman has a, a plan in mind. You know, Jeremiah 29, 11, I've got plans for you. God has a plan in mind for us when he chooses us. And it's a plan for our benefit, but primarily it's a plan for his glory. So the metal is chosen, the plan is there, it's conceived, and the workman begins to grind away at the metal. And sometimes there's a lot of metal that needs to be ground away. Sometimes there's just little bits, little burrs that have to come off. But you grind away to shape the metal. Sometimes, <laughs> lucky us, God grinds away at us to shape us. Sometimes he has to take big chunks off of us to change our direction. Sometimes he has to just fine tune those little burrs that get in the way. But he will grind us. And sometimes it's not pleasant, this grinding process. Look at all the sparks, man, when they put it on the grinding wheel. But it's necessary. And then comes the heat treating. Man, they fire that stuff up. Why? So that that metal can become a useful tool, not just a piece of metal. Because without the heat treating, it might be too soft. 
It might not hold an edge. And so they heat treat it. Because when I'm weak, he makes me strong. And so my heat treating might be some suffering in my life. He's shaping. He's strengthening. We are his workmanship. You're going through something in life. You ask God why. Better to just ask him when. When do we get to the next part, God? Because I know there's going to be something else. Because your plans for me are for good and for your glory. The tempering, part of that heat treatment, the tempering, if you don't do it, the blade might chip or even break. It's got to be hardened just right to make it a useful tool. So the grinding, the heating, the tempering, here's where it comes together in the honing of the edge. If you don't hone that edge, if you don't sharpen and shapen and grind and all this other stuff, if you don't get to where you can hone the edge, And I'm afraid too many of us stop short. We feel like, oh my, Jesus, you have worked me over so much in life. What are you calling me to? I still don't understand where the next steps are, where I'm going. What is going on here, God? You have ground on me. You have shaped me. You have chosen me. I believe that. But I don't get where it's all going to be. There's still the honing of the edge. Because a dull knife is no good. The knife will find its greatest expression only when it's in the hands of the master craftsman. You know, I believe we miss God's blessing when we step back and try to take a break and not let him finish the job. In church, I'm saying by his grace, he has saved us and he wants to finish the job of what he's doing in your life individually. I was telling a friend just the other day, I'm the pastor guy, and I get to meet with a few of my church members on a regular basis for discipleship, and we get to check in, and I get to meet with some other pastors on a regular basis, and we get to check in, we get to see God sharpen us and hone us and all of this. But for the majority of you, I don't have a regular time. And I don't even know if I could fit you all in, but I'd probably try. If you want to ever hang out, Call me and let's compare schedules. But that's how I'm going to know when I have those conversations with you what God is doing in your life. That's how you're going to know what God is doing in my life. Claudia asked me for a pastor's report for the book of reports. So you want to kind of know what I'm doing? That'll be out in a couple of weeks. It's pretty sketchy. Pastors only work one day a week. (laughs) Half a day at that. But I am concerned with your well-being in your walk with Christ. I'm concerned with your well-being. And I'm concerned with your well-being and your walk with Christ. Because that's the, the edge that he's putting on you. And he's honing you to be held in his hand and to be used. Tool in the hands of the master craftsman brings glory to the master craftsman, not the tool. You let God do all this in your life, you may not get the glory. Wow, that's an amazing knife. That's kind of cool looking, got a nice handle, got a ooh, sharp edge, all this shiny and everything, that's cool. I wonder how they made it. That's amazing. The real glory goes to the craftsman behind the tool. And our work, church, is to set the captives free. Our work is to take the good news of Jesus Christ, the graceful thing that he's done in your life, to tell other people because they need that elegance of God in their life. And that's our job. That's why we have been conceived and chosen and hammered and shaped and burned and tempered ground and honed 
because other people need to hear of the grace of God. He's created good works for you to walk in. You didn't have to think of the stuff. He's already thought of the stuff for you to do. He's created the good works. You just get to walk in it. He's prepared you. He's created you. He's gifted you. He's done all these things for His honor, His glory. Oh, what am I going to do with my life now that I'm... What am I going to do with my life now that this is... You don't have to worry about that. God's in charge. Gracefully, eloquently, He is in charge of your life. And that's worth being thankful for. Let me close with 2 Corinthians 12, 9. It just simply says, my grace is sufficient for you. Amen. Oh, all the church ought to just scream. Amen. Amen. My grace, my elegant simplicity of giving you life and preparing you is sufficient. It's enough. Sufficiency simply means it meets the needs of the proposed end. And the proposed end in this church is God's glory. And you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you will meet the end goal because of His grace in your life. On the cross, Jesus said, it's finished. All the grace has been done. All the grace has been given. It's finished. And that's kind of good news. Your salvation and the salvation of the world has been readied, has been prepared, has been planned, and His grace is what I'm so thankful for in this church and in my own life. His grace. So Father, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for how you have been patient with me, how you've chosen me, how you've chosen others, how you've moved us and shaped us, how you prepared us for the task of taking your good news, your salvation, to the rest of the world. God, I thank you for your elegant movements in the life of this church. I see you be so busy. I see you being busy in things that I've not seen in a long time. And I see your hand at work. People come up to me all this past week, God. People have come up to me and told me what you are doing in their lives and how they want to respond to that. Father, you're not hiding from me. You're revealing yourself to me. And I thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the time when... I would invite you to recognize the grace of God in your life. If you've never received Christ to forgive you of your sins, to save you, to lead you, to be Lord of your life, now's a good time. If you'd like to come and talk to me or Brandon or anybody, now's a good time. If you have walked away from God, but God has put it on your heart to walk back, now's a good time. If you're just feeling like you're out there fighting a battle all by yourself, you wish you had someone to come stand alongside of you, this church will do it. Come be a part of us. Now's the time. If God just puts anything on your heart and you want to pray about it, now's the time as we sing.